Hi, Elizabeth. Great to talk to you again. And uh, thanks for making time for this interview. Uh, where are you speaking to us from and how has uh, the year been so far? Today I'm in Reno, Nevada at our offices here and we it's been rough. You know, we had to close down the offices for a while, but now they're back open again and uh, just practicing social distancing and taking it day by day. Take us back to the beginning, if you don't mind. How did you first hear about the Paralon Project and how did you get involved? Interestingly enough, it was back in the 90s and uh, NASA actually approached me to look at some data. Um, they said that there was this, this man, which was Anna Anna Voltson, that had come to them with this idea about flying a glider with no engine up into the stratosphere with an ultimate goal of 90,000 feet, he, maybe 100,000 feet. And so uh, they wanted to know if this was, if he was crazy or if this was doable. Uh, and so I took the job on from NASA, analyzed all kinds of data, a lot of radio sun data in different locations around the globe, very specific locations, and told them that he was not crazy, that this was doable. And, and then a little after that, I, I actually met ANR. From a meteorologist's perspective, what is compelling about this project and what uh, do we stand to learn by executing these flights in the stratosphere? Oh, well, first of all, it's just so fascinating from, from many perspectives. For me, I really like the fact that we're learning so much about the tropospheric stratospheric interactions. We're learning about the stratosphere, uh, which, you know, we do send balloons up and there are aircraft that you know, some military aircraft, but to fly in stratospheric mountain waves over the mountainous regions, we really have little to no data up in the stratosphere in those locations, because once you launch a balloon, it's going to be off down following the winds. Um, and then really a, a big part of it too, is the fact that it's a manned glider. I think that really gives people uh, instead of, I mean, I, unmanned aircraft are great and they have their place, but the fact that men are risking, and women, we don't have any women pilots at the moment, but men are risking their lives to go up in this glider to the edge of space. I still think as that element of excitement and exploration that we just don't get with unmanned vehicles. In terms of data collection, what is it about the Paraline aircraft that makes it an ideal scientific research platform? Well, we're a zero emissions glider uh, aircraft vehicle. So it's great. We're not polluting the atmosphere, which we're trying to measure. So measuring, you know, aerosols, atmospheric constituents uh, and the like, we're not, we're not a polluter up there. And also the glider is steerable and maneuverable. So we can fly transects. We can do all kinds of things that are great for scientists in terms of uh, analyzing the atmosphere. Do we have less data about the atmosphere in those less populated parts of the planet than we would if we were doing this somewhere else that was more heavily populated? Boy, that's for sure. Not only do we have less data, in fact, in the El Calafate re region, other than the balloons that we're launching, um, there's like a hundreds of miles in each direction where there's almost nothing. The soundings uh, aren't launched on a daily basis, you know, the standard soundings launched around the globe, anywhere near uh, where we're located. Uh, there are some LIDARs, but they're south, very far south and north of where we are. So it's pretty much a void uh, where we're flying. <laughs> and so what we're gathering is really unique because we don't have any data there. We don't have a lot of control over when we get to fly into the stratosphere or to a given altitude, do we? Not at all. And there's so many uh, parameters that are involved. First of all, we can't have two strong crosswinds at the surface. Uh, we can't fly in IFR conditions, can't go in icing conditions. Um, we also, the, the best conditions are when it's a prefrontal situation where there's a front off the coast of South America and the polar night jet is active and the polar night jet is the edge of it is where near where we are. Um, that's kind of the perfect setup overall scenario for getting these mountain waves where they'll go up into the stratosphere. You get a handful of, of very good days, potential good days to fly high in, in, in Argentina. 
and the window for those good days is fairly limited in terms of time of year and, and number of weeks per year, correct? Yes, the the polar night jet starts and the polar vortex starts to be active uh, in uh, well in the southern hemisphere. It can about May, you know, April, May, but June then it's really ramping up, and so we try to be there July, August, September. We talk a lot about the polar vortex and how dependent we are on the polar vortex and the polar night jet to get those stratospheric mountain waves that can take the aircraft to 90,000 feet. What exactly is the polar vortex? How does it differ from the polar night jet? And what is it about it that is so vital to those high altitude flights? Well, the polar vortex is like the whole system and the polar night jet is part of it. It's like saying a cor the cornea is part of your eye. The cornea would be in this case, an analogy, the polar night jet, and your whole eye system would be the polar vortex. And so the polar vortex, what happens is um, near the, in the poles in the respective winter times, so we're in you know Southern hemisphere, it's very cold and the tropics are warm. And that temperature differential along with the rotation of the earth causes the polar vortex to form where you get the polar night jet, which travels over Argentina from west to east, so it's, it's clockwise when you look when you're looking at the, the southern hemisphere. And so um, it rotates and so this polar night jet is up in the stratosphere. It's very similar to our jet stream we have that we think of when we're flying you know general aviation 30, 35,000 foot, except it's up at the top of the troposphere into the stratosphere. And we need this as part of Perlan. We need to be the on the edge of this because it allows increasing energy with altitude that we're able to use. And it takes the mountain waves from low levels and transports them up high. In 2018, on September 2nd, the team set the subsonic world altitude record, 76,124 feet. And going into the 2019 season, the thought was, well, we've uh, done the envelope expansion. It's safe to go higher in the aircraft. And all we need is that sort of perfect day. What happened, meteorologically speaking, in 2019? Ah, very good question, because we had a very unusual event, especially for the Southern Hemisphere. We, get, we had a sudden stratospheric warming event. Um, they do occur in the Northern Hemisphere uh, more often than in the Southern. In the Southern Hemisphere, we hadn't had one since 2002. All of a sudden, we get tremendous war warming in the stratosphere, in a very short period of time, a matter of days. And this causes a breakdown of the polar night jet. And in fact, it ends up causing a reversal sometimes even in, in the winds, instead of being west to east, they'll even switch around and be light easterly. So uh, the polar vortex and the polar night jet ends up falling apart. And so that was very interesting for a scientific uh, research project, but not great for trying to get to high altitudes. <laughs> what do we have in store, scientifically speaking, for the 2021 season? It's going to be great. First of all, we have the same suite of instruments we had before, which uh, are so many, a uh, five-hole probe for turbulence, uh, temperature, winds, uh, UVA, UVB, ultraviolet, ozone, uh, a radiation sensor, but what's really uh, exciting is we're adding another another sensor, and it's the Airbus Monarch sensor. It's a GP GPS radio uh, radio occultation sensor, and what it does is it measures water vapor in the atmosphere. And the reason that is so important is because water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas. And we, we know very little about it in the stratosphere because we don't measure it well in the stratosphere. Once we get to cold temperatures and low humidities, most water vapor sensors uh, really don't do a good job. And the other thing is water vapor varies tremendously around the globe between one and 4% around the globe. So we don't have a good handle of water vapor in the stratosphere. And here it is the most important greenhouse gas. So if you think about it, climate models and weather models that uh, model things like mountain waves and gravity waves and water vapor, uh, they're very crude. We don't do a good job at that. So it's going to help tremendously. Can you sort of explain in layman's terms what a radio occultation sensor is and how it operates? Yes, what it does is uh, 
the GPS satellites that are, are around, as these satellites uh, set on the horizon, either down or up, just right when they're on the edge of the horizon, it looks at the refraction of the of the GPS signal. And from that, it's able to calculate water vapor in that area of the atmosphere. The theory being that the more water vapor there is, the more the signal would be refracted before it reached the sensor? That's correct. Elizabeth, since 2016, when Parallel Project started operating in Patagonia, what are some of the more noteworthy discoveries that you and the team have made? Well, so many, so many different things we've learned. We've learned quite a bit about uh, stratospheric mountain waves, how they form. Uh, something quite interesting is that um, they can be triggered spontaneously in the stratosphere. Uh, and we're learning more about how and why right now about that. They don't have to be, that is triggered from down below in the troposphere. Um, but something very intriguing is that we've seen very sharp horizontal temperature gradients in the stratosphere from these mountain waves. And so if a commercial airliner, let's say we're flying in, hit these uh, stratospheric mountain waves, they it would flummox the autopilot system because it wouldn't know how to respond. We've seen 20 degrees C changes in 10 kilometer horizontal distances, just unbelievable. And um, import, what's important about that is we've learned that we can, we're trying to learn to sniff out the waves actually, um, because the temperature gradient is maximum in the middle of a rising wave, it's minimum it, where the wave is de descending and it's zero right in between the two. So we're coming up with a system with a very responsive temperature sense where we're, and an algorithm we're working on to try and sense out when we're in, you know, rising motion, descending motion, or no motion at all, but so that we can sniff out these mountain waves. There's a lot that we actually don't know about the atmosphere still, isn't there? There is so much. In fact, uh, when I first started in atmospheric sciences, uh, people thought the stratosphere was just the quiet place where nothing happened really. Um, and now we know it's the complete opposite. Uh, there's so much going on. And on top of it, space weather is now a huge deal. There's weather in space and we're learning all about that. So there's so much to be explored uh, just in our atmosphere here on our planet. So it's, it's incredible. We have uh, a lot of like mass exchanges of uh, chemical constituents between the troposphere and the stratosphere. There's a lot more interaction. We used to think there was little to no interaction between the two. Now we realize there's a lot more. Um, these are areas where severe turbulence can occur when you have folding with the troposphere and the stratosphere, when you have breaking mountain waves, um, all sorts of things. We're learning that there's a lot more going on in our atmosphere at high altitudes than we thought. And this also is pertinent to all of the unmanned aircraft that are going to be flying up in these areas now. They're going to encounter uh, things that they didn't expect. We have all kinds of waves, gravity waves. They can, they can emanate from, in our case, the gravity waves we're using are mountain waves generated from mountain ranges, but they can uh, be caused by hurricanes, tsunamis, earthquakes, large thunderstorms. Um, so, and these waves, can travel hundreds of miles and uh, cause all kinds of turbulence and, and problems with aviation. Your company, Weather Extreme, is involved in a lot of great science, but on a personal level, uh, is Perlon Project one of the more exciting things that you get to do in the course of a year? Definitely. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I've been involved in it for 20 something years. Uh, I, I don't want to count how many years, <laughs> a long time. Yes, it's near and dear to my heart. And the team too, you know, is, is such a great team. That's what makes it such a great project. It's not just an it. It's, I feel like we're, you know, it's a team of family. So what are you looking forward to the most in 2021? Getting back to flying again, hopefully, uh, hopefully we're able to travel to South America um, and the, this COVID-19 situation has hopefully 
allowed us to, to travel back down there and and get back to doing what we do, researching the atmosphere and trying to fly high. Do you think that Paralon will ever run out of things to discover or explore in the stratosphere? Not in my lifetime, <laughs> luckily. Well, Elizabeth, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, spend with us today out of uh, what I know is a very busy day. I hope the next time I get to see you is in person and uh, best of all would be if it's down in Patagonia in 2021. That'd be great. Thanks so much, Jamie. Thanks for the opportunity.